Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you to this second sight and sound program. It is my pleasure to introduce Carmen Bambach, who is the curator and the scholar of this spectacular Michelangelo show. And uh, I would like to have her say a few words uh, about Michelangelo and the show before we begin our program. so nice to see another packed house at the fourth sold out event attached to the Michelangelo show. Uh, Michelangelo has been a rock star in New York. There are only today until nine o'clock and Monday until nine o'clock before this exhibition vanishes. It is not traveling anywhere else the works are much too fragile for that. And if there is anything I would like our audience, our visitors to take away, is the sense of having walked into the sacred space of Michelangelo's creativity and journeyed through his art, through his life, until the age of almost 89 years old when he dies. Let me also say that perhaps the most uh, timeless elements of Michelangelo's art are the expressive force, the terribilita as his contemporaries understood it. The word in English, awesomeness, is not quite appropriate for that. The power of the imagery, and then of course the technical virtuosity of his hand, the sheer miraculous technical virtuosity di sua mano. Thank you. So the idea that uh, Michelangelo was a rock star um, in New York is a useful way to begin because he was a rock star from his own lifetime and without interruption uh, since his death in 1564. This is an unusual Sight and Sound program, uh, Sound program because the work we're going to play is not from the same time period as Michelangelo. We usually have synchronous examples where the art and the music comes from the same historical moment. This is not the case. So the interesting question is why at the end of his life, as a very sick man, did Dmitry Shostakovich choose to set 11 poems by Michelangelo? What was it about Michelangelo? And what can we learn about drawing and music and language? Um, the first thing to remember is that Michelangelo, as uh, Carmen Bambach said, was a rock star not only here, but um, particularly through the 19th century. Um, if you read the composer Robert Schumann's day books, you'll discover that he speculated on how musicians and artists lined up uh, as similar. And he was one of many who made the following comparison. If Michelangelo had two rivals, Leonardo Older and Raphael Younger, uh, uh, the comparison, leave Leonardo to the side, for the 19th century came between Michelangelo and Raphael. Michelangelo was seen as a kind of prototype romantic painter and artist, interested in the vigorous, free, dramatic, sense of form, and Raphael was a kind of purist cultivator of beauty. Very similar to a comparison between the sublime, the 18th century, so we have the sublime as being almost violent and, uh, and breaking decorum, and the beautiful being contained by a kind of formal crystalline technique. So Raphael on the one side, Michelangelo on the other. And they put Mozart with, Rocca, uh, with, with Raphael and Beethoven with Michelangelo. Just as Raphael had been put with Petrarch and Michelangelo with Dante, who appears in our music today. 
there was this whole uh, sense of a division between the kind of excessive individuality, that was the way Jakob Borchardt, the great historian of the Renaissance put it, of Michelangelo, and the restrained Aristotelian moderation of a Raphael. That was uh, the moderate, temperate, uh, completely controlled beauty of Raphael as opposed to the explosive, um, um, almost sensuous character, uh, sensuous character of uh, Michelangelo. And uh, this was certainly um, uh, part of the way in which uh, the German historian Hermann Grimm, whose parents, father and uncle, were the, the Grimm fairy tales, uh, one of the founders of German Romanticism, one of the first great art historians, and wrote a biography of Michelangelo. So this notion of his audacity, of the terribilita, the sort of angry image of a free artist, the closest comparison was, of course, Beethoven. Now, this notion of, um, of, a, of a kind of artist that, that is somehow in conflict with decorum and steps out of the bounds of, of, of normal behavior, uh, this image um, also made him um, a canon of, uh, of cultivated taste. And when the October Revolution when the Soviet Revolution took place, people asked the question, what did the Soviets think about culture? What did Lenin and Lu Lunacharsky, his first uh, Secretary of Culture, um, Commissar of Culture, what did they, in the new Soviet state, for the proletariat and the working masses, what did they want? Well, the surprising thing is they were themselves very much possessors of conventional 19th century cultivated education. So classical music, Beethoven, Bach, Handel, Mozart, that was something that every worker should learn to love. And the parallel in literature, Shakespeare, the great classic Russian novelist, and in art, it was a kind of small number of great artists of the past, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Rembrandt. And Michelangelo was actually um, put into a kind of education agenda for the new world of the Soviet space in which um, this was kind of a, a patrimony that should be handed down uh, to the new society. And we think of these cultures often now as elitist in some bad way. But we forget that the communists and socialists believed it was not elitist. It was universal, the way communism should be universal. It was about an achievement of the human being that should be shared irrespective of class and nationality. In 1964, a Russian book came out on Michelangelo. And it was actually that Shostakovich looked at this book. It was a, a, a life of Michelangelo and he got intrigued with it. Um, he, uh, he was attracted first, I think, by the visual and then by the poetry. And uh, uh, interestingly, Michelangelo was also a political exile in Rome from Florence. Not as embittered a political exile, let's say, as Dante had been, but the question of exile was on Shostakovich's minds and the whole issue of what it meant to be in exile. So Dante, for example, people argue his exile from Florence and the fact that he was no longer a politician in Florence gave him the opportunity to become the greatest poet, um, some think, of all time. Uh, exile and political participation, exile and artistic participation, why was it on Shostakovich's mind? Because Shostakovich lived a very complex life as an artist, an inner life and an external life under a tyranny. He was denounced twice by Stalin, 136 and once in 1948. And the idea of what it meant to be a free artist was very much on his mind. In addition, he was honored by the state. He was almost an official artist at this point of his life. And just the year before, Alexander Solzhenitsyn had gone into exile with the approval of the Brezhnev government uh, to the United States. It was a neo-Stalinist moment in Russian history. 
and Shostakovich was not sure what to do. He was frail. Uh, he was continued to be a kind of official voice of communist culture, and he struggled with this. At the end of his life, he then turned to these 11 poems. Now, there, Michelangelo was a poet, um, not as great a poet as he was a, a draftsman and a, a painter and sculptor, but um, uh, as many of his contemporaries, uh, we segment creativity, we professionalize it. How can an artist be a poet? How can a poet be a musician? And this is something that the Renaissance did not actually um, think was valid. And uh, he was one of many Renaissance artists who occupy themselves in more than one form. Um, he chose 11. Why 11? So it's not numerological. There are two. Um, one, the first one, which is called Truth, which I'll come to in a moment. And then the eighth one, which is called Creativity. That leaves nine. And there are two, three groups of three. The three groups of three are from two sonnets and a madrigal. They're about morning, early morning. Then about love and about separation. Um, then there's one around the political aspect. There's anger, Dante, and to the exile. Those are three of Michelangelo's poems. And the last is very personal, and that is night, death, and immortality. The immortality actually is written for one of the, by Michelangelo, for one of the, he was uh, a man of homoerotic tendencies. No one actually knows, uh, nor is it interesting to speculate what actually went on, but there's no doubt that he had a preference for the male body, both as an object and in company. And the last of the songs that um, Shostakovich sets is um, an epitaph for one of the objects of his attraction. Um, in the middle, uh, there is um, uh, the one on creativity is uh, a, um, a sonnet on the death of Vittoria Colonna, who was a very close, a woman very close to, to Michelangelo, who had a kind of spiritual sensibility about the suppression of the body and the mortification of the flesh to actually reach a higher level of spirituality, a kind of uh, struggle. So these are a mixture. The two uh, are related to his patron, Julius II. Um, uh, and so there are, uh, actually, the opens with a sonnet to Julius II. So Shostakovich arranges these, um, and um, he actually saw this cycle as possibly being the basis of a 16th symphony. He was a symphonist, as you may know, with 15 completed symphonies. And his model was Gustav Mahler. And his attitude to writing music as he got older was more and more simplified and very confessional, very personal, like Mahler, expressing his inner sensibility, a very subjective sense, very much similar to the 19th century prejudice that viewed Raphael as somehow being objective and Michelangelo as the voice of real subjectivity. So he, uh, he finally, um, doesn't write the symphony, but writes the suite for piano and voice, and then proceeds um, to, um, to organize it musically. So the question for you as a listener, we're gonna go through the music, and then we'll look at the slides of, from the, this wonderful show, and then idea of thinking about how music and painting are different, drawing are different, how they're similar, uh, and how in the 20th century, one could see in this artwork something that connected to the musical vocabulary that Shostakovich starts with. The first song is called Truth, but remember this is a Russian translation from Italian. Um, he didn't like the translation and actually had Wozniacki do another translation, but it didn't fit to the music, so he stuck with this translation uh, by Abram Efros. Istina, which is the word used here, is not like pravda, which is already truth. Istina means spiritual truth, the essence. It's kind of a spiritual notion of a kind of sense of the absolute um, inner truth. And he opens the cycle with this. Uh, Mark 
partial, almost dramatic opening, um, lest you think that this is going to be a cheery 40 minutes. <laughs> when you get to the 10th song, it reappears in the song on the, the poem on death. this is very conservative, very realistic music, tonal, very clear to be understood, there's no mistaking it, and this is a radical distance between the way Shostakovich speaks in music and the way music was being written by Elliot Carter in America. Right at the brink of the decline of modernism and the resurgence of kind of romantic and minimal musical vocabulary. But for this time, this was very conservative, very straightforward, very accessible. And it finally comes back one last time at the end of death, before the last song on immortality, in this form. Nothing could be simpler than the tail with the horn from the theme finally landing with a pedal, a constant note on the bottom, a C sharp, lending finally in a single unison note. Um, the, um, the point is that Shostakovich wanted to be a kind of musical equivalent of, of draftsman. In other words, without color. So when you look at the show, you'll see that this is not painting. In music, the difference between orchestration, a work that is filled with these instruments, and the actual, what you would call form of the work, can be analogous to the drawings you'll see that are sketches or preparation for the Sistine Chapel, and well, was finally what the Sistine Chapel looks like that color often, and even the surface of something, obscures uh, the actual artistic form. And for a sculptor, particularly, the relationship of the form and the material. Shostakovich is very aware of which instruments he uses and the simplicity of the musical line not to be confused with the color of that line. So there is a kind of also visual spatiality to this music the end of his life. This is the way the truth uh, sonnet ends.
this is not cheerful, happy music. But as um, some of our major politicians know, the truth is not happy. And um, so there is um, um, the confrontation with the spiritual essence of life is a struggle. And uh, that struggle is connected to creativity, the role of the artist, truth and creativity. This is the eighth song, and here you see actually Shostakovich using the full instruments, the material of the orchestra, the way a sculptor does, and actually rhythmically depicting what he thinks must have been like to shape a piece of sculpture. The idea that Michelangelo's David was made out of one piece of marble is an incredible feat. So, how does Shostakovich show and you can hear the flying chips of stone as the physical labor of the sculptor proceeds. The, the, the intensity that is in Michelangelo's works is depicted in a musical manner. We turn to the set that is about politics, and the first one is about anger. was his relationship to political power, more so than Michelangelo. And in the age of censorship, music is the most favored art form. In censorship, the censors of literature and painting have some vague idea of what they're looking at or reading. But censors are, by and large, stupid. <laughs> You've never met a very brilliant censor. Only to even in the Russian 19th century, when the, um, the uh, bureaucracy was po populated by not very hardworking members of a gentry class, the top run of them were not actually censors. Musicians get away with more. And so the anger against um, the condition of life uh, is reflected here in a version which you just heard at the end of the song where you'll notice that the notes, the pitches, move ahead of the rhythm in a kind of crossway where this sort of conflict of emotion that is anger is depicted musically. important figure in terms of political exile and the relation to art, and that's Dante, and this is the depiction of the figure of Dante. The 
So this leads also to the question of exile and um, the uh, sense of exile uh, is also depicted by Shostakovich with a tremendous sense of dignity as well as sharpness. that there is an inherent sadness in the condition. And of course, Shostakovich is working through Michelangelo's poetry, looking at the poetry in the context of this biography and his own access, as many people had, to reproductions of, of Michelangelo's work. The condition of exile ends in loneliness, in solitude. The um, second group is the more personal, and that has to do with mourning. This is the sort of depiction of mourning. So the growly sound of a solo bass in a kind of dark minor mode ends up in sort of a cheerful major. Um, and uh, this um, leads then, the waking up leads to the recognition of the space around you and the sense of love. This um, sense of love uh, is very pleasant, and the poetry very pleasant. There is a piece of this music missing, and that's the soloist, intentionally, so that you see the musical fabric before actually you hear the words set to the musical line. Um, and, but love leads uh, to separation, and this separation is the one song that is done completely freely where the text leads under a very simple harmonic background. Again, the simplicity of the musical materials. Insofar as uh, moods are conveyed by harmony and by what we call keys, Przegowicz makes very good use of this 18th and early 19th century sensibility that our ear moves, as you will, in this harmonic background with the changing sensibility of the text. And finally, we now come to the last, uh, the last grouping, 
the last three. Uh, and um, uh, after a separation, uh, uh, we finally come to night as morning led to love, night leads to death. And here is the quotation that you heard already from Death, the end of the 10th song. And finally, immortality. We have two excerpts from that. And uh, this is very unusual because the opening tune is written by Dmitry Shostakovich, but he used a tune that he wrote when he was nine years old. So like Michelangelo, who was a prodigy as a painter, Shostakovich was a prodigy as a composer. And when facing his death, and the question of his afterlife, he goes back to a song that he wrote when he was nine. Doubt immortality is more fun than, um, than mortality. Um, something to look forward to. And um, uh, the, um, however, the end, which is a kind of, he takes this theme apart. He, he, he sort of pulls it apart to its bare, simple outlines. The tune is faded, the harmonic change less aggressive, and in this vibraphone, the bells, and the so fading out of, of life. Uh, this is arguably the, the sweetest Shostakovich's uh, testament, um, his last will and testament as an artist. And the question is why he went back looking at Michelangelo who is a symbolic also of the great cultural heritage 
that the Soviet state that he had served wanted to integrate and disseminate uh, uh, to the wider population, to bridge the gulf in education and taste between the elite, the intelligentsia, and the ordinary person. He wanted to write music that would reach you without having to go to school, without having to know anything, have to go to harmony classes, uh, to actually be able to respond to music spontaneously in the way that was simply evident in the great Renaissance painters. So our first slide is um, from the exhibit is that um, uh, Vasari was the author of a biography of, 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 of Michelangelo, but other artists. And um, as um, Carmen Bambach points out, uh, the Viennese in the turn of the century, um, the two of them uh, did a fantastic study of how artists' lives are told. Artists don't, we don't tell the life of artists the way we tell the life of our neighbor. We embellish it. And there are all kinds of tropes of what makes a good artist. Undiscovered talent, early discovered talent, misunderstood talent, misfit talent. There are all kinds of sort of patterns that fit in. Vasari is the locus classicus of those kinds of things. But this is, um, uh, shortly after the death, this is a reflection of the enormous fame that he had in his lifetime. And these are medals that are actually struck before he dies for himself. Now imagine immortality. What would be better than having a medal struck for you? Um, and uh, I think if we can have private rockets going into the sky, we probably can convince, we can privatize the US Mint and have no celebratory medals struck for us that are convertible currency with our pictures on it. And this is a bust also before he died. And these are portraits of the man. Now, this is more or less chronological. This is early, so the Sistine Chapel, as you know, is worked on for a long period of time. This is very early in his career. And here you see the sort of simplicity of material, this, this, both in the drawing and the tremendous design brilliance and the energy that jumps off the page and the sinuous sculptural quality of these images. You'll see some handwriting. Just the, the three-dimensionality and the virtuosity, absolute virtuosity that Shostakovich had himself. These are mostly male figures. And this is, he was very proud of his handwriting. He, he didn't have any children, he was very family oriented and he always chided his nephew for his bad handwriting. We shouldn't worry about this because the new generation has no handwriting. And um, <laughs> because it's not necessary to have handwriting. But you can see it's very beautiful. So it's very important to realize that handwriting is to language like a beautiful book. Handwriting is to words, very similar to art and images, that the handwriting actually can be an object of beauty. And there's a drawing on the side of it. But just the fantastic ability to evoke space and motion in the drapery. Of course, this is very famous. Someone told me that there's a film, which I've never seen, called The Agony and the Ecstasy, is that right? And there's some hokey Charlton Heston, I think, plays. No further, no worse insult was ever befell Michelangelo. But in any event, apparently there's some scene, I never have seen this, that two, two clouds meet, which are supposed to be these hands. Yeah. This is a Libyan Sibyl, um, um, very famous um, image. This is just in case you can't get into the show. <laughs> he also did completed portraits, not only sketches.
is now the mid of his career. He was an architect as well. You'll see in a moment that there's a tremendous sense of the spatiality and design in which images stand. There's something to a musician that would appeal, which is, first of all, in the Soviet sense, the Soviets were very ambivalent about abstraction and modernism. In fact, opposed to it. And particularly in painting, they maintained a kind of ideology which later became socialist realism, and in the novel as well. And so they were opposed uh, to things that did not actually demonstrate some relationship of realism, some affirmation of um, an objective external world as opposed to a very distorted subjective aestheticism of, aestheticization of the external world. This is musical painting in the sense, drawing in the sense that it's motion, the vector of motion is absolutely present. And the intensity the absolute intensity of vision. Even the depiction of death, Christ after the crucifixion, it is, um, this is, so this is a madrigal with um, a study, a visual study and his own text. The one on truth uh, that um, is dedicated to Vittoria Colonna, that's a, pe a time where he writes a great deal of his poetry. So I chose this one because this is dedicated to the same woman to whom one of the sonnets we Shostakovich set is dedicated. And now we near the last phase of his career. We reach immortality. And here's some aspect of his writing and his architectural work. There is. Thank you very much. We'll take a short break and turn to a performance of the whole cycle. And then, if there's time, we'll entertain questions from the audience. Thank you very much.
Радос невесолого занятия, По злату кост цветам на перебой, Заприкасаться с милой головой, И лнут лапсанием всюду без изъятия. И сколько наслаждения для платья, Жимать естам и не спадать волной. Как от радности этой золотой еланити заключат объятия. И лишь он не злой, нарядно не дивиас, блестал узор. Ее смыкай 
нравится в крупе ты молоды. Очисти пояс ласкова вияс, как будто шепчет, не расстанусь не. Скажи, любовь, воистину ли взору Желанная предстала красота И льдом моя творящая мечта Случайный лик взяла тебе
się mają Susiedztwa wad bez was Ciebie nam mógł Raz gluchi wiek mał wam śmiech ci Raz łuku Sercem bol się nie tajlu, ni wolz glasaw, ni wzdochaw, ni rydani. Co wam nie wid Madonna gniot stradani? Czaśmyci i ślemi i krow Chrystowu pradają na pies, na szycie storm, na kopie kresy ścięc. Ustaś Chrystowi terpieliwa niemi. Wasi wyflejemi, ile snowa w rysie krowiu i dany pies, zatem z todu się głuba marimy sztoliec i mila serdzie cię z im na zamkiemi. Stała buzi, by dla mnie nie dawno już nie jest ciel. Diamanty i straszos, jak ma w meduzi. No jeśli biedna sława i pochadziel, kaki jest nam tak na gotowie, buzi, pod znamienem i nim, i no Oh. 
Tok pabliti jej ro prejde tara bjajet. Jest mastera, katori napravljajet, jej bo udar, on dielo mnie pamo.
here and um, not everybody got to stand up but uh, thank you very much thank you um, <laughs> so part of the story here actually we turn the lights up so people can leave freely um, without tripping um, there are there are, <laughs> there are opportunities you have to ask questions uh, about um, not only of us, but of members of the orchestra. And so this is a chance to ask something you always wanted to ask or were afraid to of a classical musician on stage. And don't feel badly about leaving, I would too. Uh, so. 
but no, um, for those who, um, so I think, um, I don't think there are microphones, so maybe we can use that microphone and hand it down. So come up to the front. That's just for the live feed. Oh, that's just live, I see. So come up, because otherwise people, yes, you have a microphone, great. Anybody want to ask any questions? Otherwise, we can go home early. Just one, that's good. Oh, there's, over there. Yeah, so the question is, I understand, is um, to see whether there is a, an art, uh, aesthetic relationship um, between Shostakovich and, and Mussorgsky. And uh, I think the answer is yes. So um, uh, among the so-called mighty handful, uh, he was, um, in a way, uh, the most original, uh, the use of pedals, um, uh, non-conventional harmonic sequences, uh, there's a lot there, um, and there's also the whole notion of, which comes from Dajomiski and from the Russian sort of self-consciously nationalist idea of the relationship of words and music, so that instead of having a beautiful melody that fits the words more or less, that the actual text drives the vocal line. Um, and uh, uh, that was an idea, and uh, certainly, um, um, yeah, I mean, Mussorgsky is, uh, is, was certainly a cult figure uh, among all that group. You know, people were always a little embarrassed by Tchaikovsky for no apparent reason, but um, <laughs> who is clearly head and shoulders the greatest of the, that, that generation. Um, but um, he was so sentimental and personal and expressive and subjective, somehow it didn't quite um, sit well. And... Um, Sierinsky went the path more of Rimsky and this coloristic, more folksy stuff in his early period. Um, so I think, yeah, Mussorgsky is a, is, a, is a figure. And during the Soviet time, they, re, they got rid of the rimsky korsakov versions of Boris and even of Night on Bald Mountain, uh, not to mind Bald Mountain's advantage, but, and, um, Pavel Lam, who did those editions, was friendly with Shostakovich. So yes, there is definitely a Mussorgsky combination. The Songs of Love and Death, he orchestrated himself, Shostakovich. So he's, yeah, he's, he's deeply involved in that aesthetic, kind of the spare, with a lot of open intervals, of the spare, <coughs> grinding, depressing, half-drunk, um, uh, end of the world, pointless and hopeless sensibility. <laughs> which has seemed so commercially successful. Uh, and um, so, yeah, I, yeah, so yes, yes. And um, there's a darkness, although Shostakovich was very disciplined by any reasonable comparison to Mussorgsky. Yeah. On average, what age did the, first this was wonderful, thank you. On average, what age did the musicians start learning music and how much time did they devote to it as children? So what, how much time they devote to what? To their music. What at what these, age? These these people the on stage. The musicians. At what age did all they time? Start? They're professionals. They're young professional musicians. No, no. As children, what age did they start? As children, what age did oh, they start? What age music? did you start? Okay, let's start from uh, before birth. Okay, one year. Stand up. Two years, three, up, 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 three, four, don't be bashful, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 
10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, got everybody, 18, one more, 19, we're counting, he just started, they both started just last year. So, um, partly because of the nature of the instrument, right, uh, middle class people always thought the best instrument to start is the piano, which is a terrible mistake. Because um, a piano is like um, playing by the numbers, no one ever gets to listen, but they you know, have the fingering and it sort of sounds right. Whereas the instruments on stage here, you have to have an ear about pitch playing in tune. So it's like singing, it's the next best thing to singing, that's the best way to start. The, the um, ultimate, ultimate instrument is the voice. So you'll notice that, that because of the, also the physical development of the human being, the violin you can make very small and hand it to you, and you can make the cello very small, but a small French horn doesn't work. You know, they, they, have to, they, you have to, they have to be grown up to do it. So you'll notice that as we got into adolescence, the back of the orchestra began to stand up because simply, you know, there is no such thing as a half-size oboe. Um, and so, uh, the best, that's why. But um, the myth about starting young um, is, is only, you know, it's a little bit of a myth. Um, you're never too old to start an instrument and never too old to play. I don't think you can start in your 20s and think you're going to become um, um, a professional performer. Maybe in the voice, because of the development of the voice, if you've done some other music things. Uh, but, but, um, uh, but to play well uh, and to play with enjoyment, you can start any time. And the only way really to love music, in my opinion, is to make it. And that doesn't mean, and that doesn't mean pushing a button. <laughs> yes. No, no, in the picture, it's a very good question. This is very pictorial music, and the question of Mussorgsky fits in here as well, because it's by Mussorgsky. So this was a, 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 um, an architect. What was interesting about Michelangelo is that he was an architect and a, and a, and a painter, Victor Hartmann, and these were the pictures that, uh, that Mussorgsky saw and set to the piano in the picture and exhibition, but there's no. Um, that was, by, that was by, it was a contemporary of his. But it's, it's perfectly pertinent because the Russian composer of the 19th century and went into the 20th is the visual realism was very important. Tremendous amount of pictorial writing, you know, all those tone poems about, about Russian mythology or uh, snow, poems about even landscape. Um, there's a lot of visual painting going on. So yeah, the relation of the visual and the auditory is very important to the, this this tradition of composers. Yeah, we'll make the last question so we can all go home. Yeah. A uh, historical political comment, if I may. Uh, Shostakovich loved the Soviet Union, but he saw what happened to the Soviet Union for a variety of reasons. I know a fair amount about Shostakovich. I've never heard this piece. I've never heard of this piece. Uh, I think it's brilliant and brilliantly performed, everybody. I regard it as a secular requiem for the Soviet Union as well as for himself. I'm glad he's the last question because he stepped into one of the hottest controversies. <laughs> and I'm pleased that it's controversial because very little about classical music is controversial. But what the gentleman said so eloquently is contested. I don't believe it. And there are a whole bunch of scholars and musicians who don't. Shostakovich was an official artist and a servant of the state. He was an unhappy guy. He knew there were problems. He was not a dissident. This was not a requiem for the Soviet state. That would have never occurred to him. He was an extremely private and withdrawn manner. 
There is a huge controversy that stems from the publication of a book by Solomon Volkov called Testimony, which tried to show that, Stalin, that uh, Shostakovich was actually a dissident counterweight. And the truth is somewhere in the middle, that music, you don't control music, that with the Fifth Symphony, after he was condemned in 36, he came back into favor. He wrote a lot of uh, nationalistic, you know, uh, pro-Soviet music, much most famous is the Seventh Symphony, written during the, in response to the Siege of Leningrad. He was a patriot, as he should have been. I don't fault him for that. He was honored by the state. He, 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 was, he was a really the poster child of, of, of artistic creativity in the Soviet Union. And uh, he had difficulties with it. Um, he, he kept his distance from Sakharov and the, dis and the dissidents. The Solzhenitsyn exile made him very nervous. He was, one time in his life, he was very courageous when Solomon Michels, um, the uh, father-in-law of uh, Mitchell Weinberg, was assassinated by Stalin in 48. He stepped in to protect the family and the children. But um, he was free of anti-Semitism, which is, makes him unique next to Rimsky Korsakov in Russian musical history. So he wins my admiration for that. But he was not, uh, this is not, uh, this is a existential, in my opinion, existential work. This is not a work of political dissent. On that controversial response, I bid you a good afternoon. <laughs>